Okay, so we are going to get started. Um, well, welcome everyone and good evening to our virtual local history presentation on getting to Greyhounhurst, planes, trains, automobiles, and more with local archivist, Judy Humphreys. I'm Julie Reinhardt, uh, CEO, Chief Librarian of the Gravenhurst Public Library. And we are really pleased to be hosting this evening's uh, event in, in conjunction with the Gravenhurst Archives. We have a great relationship with the archives and we are so, so happy to be able to do this virtually for everyone. Um, before we get started, I would like to read our land acknowledgement statement. We acknowledge that the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and Métis people were and are still the keepers and caretakers of the land and waters upon which the town of Gravenhurst now sits, which is covered by the Williams Treaty and the One Dish with One Spoon Treaty. We are deeply grateful for the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples who have shaped and strengthened this community for the benefit of future generations. And we are committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect. So you will notice that we've mo uh, muted everyone this evening. Um, and if you do experience any uh, network issues, we do suggest that you um, turn off your video. A lot of people have already done that, I believe, so, which is great. Um, yeah, and it, it doesn't take up as much bandwidth that way, so. Um, as there will be a bit of time for Judy um, to answer questions at the end of the presentation, we are asking people uh, with questions to send these in by using the group uh, chat feature, uh, which is at the bottom of your screen. There's a good possibility J Judy won't actually get to all the questions this evening. And if that's the case, please feel free uh, to send your questions into Judy directly or to the library and we will be able to um, make sure those get passed on to Judy. Uh, just so everyone, um, is aware we will be recording tonight's presentation as, as mentioned, and it'll be on the website. Um, now to my introduction of Judy Humphreys. So Judy was born uh, in London, Ontario, uh, but she grew up in various small towns before gaining an English degree at Western University and her teaching degree at Queen's University. Uh, she came to Gravenhurst High School in 1973 to teach English, but left teaching in 1982 to raise babies. When they were old enough to be in school full time, a fantastic opportunity uh, would lead to a 20 year career. And that came her way. And that was of course her time that she spent at the uh, Ontario Fire College as their librarian. Uh, her third and present career as a volunteer, and it is a career, it is a big commitment, um, came with, um, came with retirement from the work world. Um, and so that's managing the Gravenhurst archives and we're very glad that she does that. Um, the history of Gravenhurst is now a full-time passionate commitment. And we are certainly pleased to have her um, and thankful, very thankful to have a, a wonderful symbi symbiotic relationship with the Gravenhurst archives here at the library. Now over to you, Judy. Hi. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we're going to explore the history of getting to Gravenhurst. I had wanted to call this getting here was half the fun. But as you will see, getting here wasn't all that much fun at all, especially for our earlier settlers. So we have decided to call the talk, Getting to Gravenhurst Planes, Trains and Automobiles. But I do hope that we will have a little bit of fun along the way. You're going to hear the word imagine used several times over the next hour or so. So please turn on your imagination. Uh -oh. 
I can't move my, my there it is. Thank you. A little bit of a glitch there for me. <laughs> this is a map of Ontario as we knew it when it was drawn in 1836. Muskoka is actually a word on the map, but really tiny and sitting on a lake. You can almost see it there on the map where the arrow is. In 1836, Muskoka, or for that matter, anything north of Barrie, this was wild land, unknown land, or it was land belonging to indigenous peoples, as you can see on that map. Georgian Bay was called Lake Iroquois. There are some very odd names for some large colored regions in the area. The blue area above the word um, two in that lower um, uh, box was called gore. The beige area above the word home, or sorry, above the word um, two is called home. And the pink area to the east was called Newcastle. We really knew very little about Upper Canada at this time. Why was there any interest in looking at this unknown wasteland area at all? Well, the War of 1812 between Britain and the United States meant that we had been involved in constant border battles. Even after the war had ended and we had come out pretty much even, we were still worried about possible invasion and we had far fewer people living here than they had living there. Those who did live here did so in a long thin strip of land shown along this map. Future resistance was clearly going to be an issue. So in 1826, Henry Briscoe and company were sent by the government out to explore, to find an east-west river for troop movement. And they did explore, but they produced no map. Again in 1829, Alexander Shuroff and a party were sent out to see what was out there, but they too produced no map. But in 1837, the government sent out David Thompson to explore, not just looking for rivers running east and west that would make troop movement possible or for places for possible defense against invasion. His mission involved finding good stands of desirable timber and fertile lands for settlement to meet the immense tide of immigration into Ontario, as well as the needs of settlers already here in Southern Ontario who had sons and daughters who would also need farms in the future. And despite his advancing years, David Thompson produced not one, but several maps. Unfortunately, as so often happens, his maps were filed in a government drawer for 20 years. Well, let's jump ahead to the moment when the government finally did act upon the recommendation that Thompson and others had made. In 1853, an act was passed, which would permit the granting of land to settlers, with provisions, of course, clearing land, building a house, residing on the property for five years, at which time they would be given title to their land. Potential settlers were encouraged to look at settlement north of Toronto. But how would a settler get there in 1853? If he had some money, he could get from Toronto as far north as Allendale, just below Barrie, by train on the Ontario Simcoe and Huron Railroad. Now that's in 1853. So the land from Toronto north to Allendale was going to be opened up, but only that far. Trains were relatively new to some settlers. So as you can see, the people in Toronto have stopped to actually take a look at and probably admire the train engine that is sitting there in front of them. If you had less money, you could take the Concord stage, a particular type of stage that was sort of hung on its springs. It swayed back and forth as the coach en encountered teeth shattering ruts and holes, again, as far only as Lake Simcoe. But the traveler had to agree to abide by the rules of etiquette or stagecoach travel. If the driver asks you to get out of the stage and walk, or in the case of the menfolk, get out and help to lift and push, you do so now and you do it with a grumbling or comment. If the team of horses starts to bolt with the stagecoach, remain inside until they finally stop. Otherwise, you'll be even more seriously hurt jumping out than staying in. Smoking and spitting are fine, but not on the leeward side of the carriage. 
remember the words of that popular song, you don't spit into the wind. It's fine to drink alcohol, but you gotta share. No swearing is allowed and no sleeping on the shoulders of other passengers. And finally, do not grease your hair. You will have a sticky mess of pomade, dust and bugs, most unattractive and gooey for the interior of the stagecoach, especially if you happen to violate number five, which is sleeping on your neighbor's shoulder. If you had very little money left at all at this point, it would be walking for you all the way, but only for the hale and hearty as the route would be through bush and for much of the journey. But settlers wanted to go farther north, especially since the population of Southern Ontario <clears throat> had increased from 400,000 in 1832 to 740,000 10 years later in 1852. Um, it was starting to get crowded in that strip of settlement. Settlers began to consider going farther north in the late 1850s, especially when a bridge was built in 1857 over the Severn River. This bridge made a huge difference in travel possibilities. It was the beginning of the ability to move north from farm country into wild country of the Canadian Shield. It bridged the barrier between what had been known and what was to come. The resulting community there was named, you guessed it, Severn Bridge. That first bridge made of wood on wooden piers must have been a dilly. It was obvious that a road was needed to move colonization further north. And in 1858, that road was begun at Washago. This is a drawing of the Corduroy Road in Aurelia Township near Washago. I can hardly imagine walking this road, let alone riding in a stagecoach over it. As you can guess, the horses really loved it. The logs were laid freshly cut and green. As they dried out, they shrank and the spaces in between the logs grew wider and wider. Imagine the bone jarring bumps from log to log to say nothing of the horses shying as they stumbled, afraid of breaking their legs. A location agent set up his headquarters at Severn Bridge and he prepared to hand out location tickets to potential settlers. Imagine trying to find the lot in all that bush that you had just selected from a map. But 17 settler families did just that along the road north from Severn Bridge. James and Letitia McCabe were among them. They built their log home around 1858, just about where the Anglican Cemetery is located in Gravenhurst today. Their little spot would be called McCabe's Landing, a combination of where they built their log home and where they stashed a scow on Lake Muskoka about a mile or so away. From the start, they opened up their home to travelers, feeding them and putting them up for the night. You could say it was the first B&B &B in Gravenhurst. By 1859, the colonization road extended all the way to South Falls. And that's the name for the falls located at what is now Muskoka Falls. Imagine building that road log by log in one year. Hard to imagine. But perhaps no one's story of getting here is more incredible than that of Joseph Brock. In 1860, in the late fall, after finishing harvesting his father's crops at Thamesford, which is a small village just not too far from London, Ontario, in southern Ontario, Joseph Brock set out on foot to go north and find himself some land. He walked all the way to McCabe's Landing. He set up a temporary shelter to mark where it was he wanted to settle, approximately where the present Baptist Church in Gravenhurst is located. And then he walked all the way back to Thamesford for the winter. In the spring of 1861, after he had helped his father sow seed for crops, he hitched up two young oxen that he had bought to a homemade conveyance, a sort of a wagon that he had made, loaded up all of his belongings, tied a cow to the back, and then set out to that's right, walk all the way back to McCabe's Landing. He constructed a log cabin in a spot pretty much where the Albion Hotel sits now and proceeded to work on acquiring a land grant of close to 100 acres of land. With this map, I just wanted to make you wince. 
This map shows the distance between Thamesford and McCabe's Landing. It's 302 kilometers using present highways. Needless to say, Brock Street in Gravenhurst bears his name and some of his descendants still live here. Again, I cannot imagine three times he walked that distance in a period of less than six months. I like to think of 1860 as a sort of watershed year. A time when Gravenhurst began with McCabe's and Joseph Brock and his family, but also a time when our world began very quickly to be divided between two types of people who came here for very, very different reasons for doing so. There were those who came here to settle, to work on clearing land, to farm, eventually perhaps to set up a shop or set up a service of some kind, but to make a home here in Gravenhurst. And there were those who came here as tourists, coming for their vacation to explore, have adventures, enjoy themselves, and then leave again. By 1860, there were 41 settlers having taken up land grants. They had five years in which to clear the trees, drain the swamps, erect a home, and live on their grant in order to receive the deed to that land. And at the same time, in 1860, there was the arrival of the first tourists to Muskoka, James Bain, age 18, and John Campbell, age 20, who came on foot for one week's vacation in the wilderness, carefree, adventurous, no thought of wanting to stay here. <clears throat> With only one week's vacation in hand, Campbell and Bain began their journey at Toronto by taking the train as far as Bell Ewart on Lake Simcoe. They boarded the steamer, the Emily May, to get to Aurelia, and then they rode a boat up Lake Kuchiching to Washago. And from there, they walked to Severn Bridge. They stayed at Hugh Dillon's Inn at Severn Bridge that night. And the next morning they walked up the colonization road to McCabe's Landing where they stopped for a drink with uh, a conversation with James and Letitia. They boarded McCabe's scow on Lake Muskoka and took a paddle up the lake, just a couple of miles as far as Daisy Island, just to explore and spend a night on the shore before paddling back and retracing their steps and their route all the way back to Toronto. These two young men were extremely well educated, especially for the time. And on their subsequent annual trips to Muskoka, they recorded their findings of plants and animals, as well as their impressions of the landscape that they had explored. And as we look back into our history, by 1864, the divisions between settlers and tourists have become more magnified. Now whole groups of tourists are starting to arrive. And in this case, they're arriving with Campbell and Bain. Bain is shown on the left in that photograph and Campbell is shown on the right. And that photograph was taken of a group that they formed in 1864 called the Muskoka Club. James Bain would go on to have a career as a publisher before becoming the first librarian for the city of Toronto. John Campbell was truly a universal scholar with gold medals in almost every subject you could take from languages to sciences, to geology, to theology. He wrote countless publications on archeology span and became a professor at the University of Montreal. Another one of the group that you see there would go on to become the president of the University of Toronto. And women adventurers, their sisters and their friends who had complained about the fact that these guys were leaving every year for a holiday in Muskoka they would join the group in 1866. In 1862, Dawson LeSueur had named the little settlement and its post office Gravenhurst. The name was taken from a book he was presently reading at that time called Gravenhurst or Thoughts on Good and Evil. None too soon, major road work was begun on that corduroy colonization road in 1864, and at least over the bridge, the logs were replaced by planks. You can see in the bottom corner on the right-hand side, a photograph of the bridge at Severn Bridge. Uh, it's, it's an amazingly strong looking bridge and it has planks across it. The rest of the way to Gravenhurst was going to be a combination of sand and gravel with corduroy over the swampy parts. So let's meet two progressive men who built their businesses helping people to get here. John Harvey Thompson, sorry, John Thompson Harvey, how about that? 
began a stagecoach line running from Washego to Severn Bridge to McCabe's Landing and eventually beyond. He himself settled in Gravenhurst and Harvey Street is where he built his home. He had the most extensive stagecoach line in the province, if not in the country, with 95 teams of horses and coaches running mail, cargo and passengers north and south along the colonization road. He must have had spaces everywhere to keep him feed those horses. It took just four hours in a stagecoach to cover the 14 miles from Washago to Gravenhurst. Remember what they're driving over. At the same time, let's meet B. Coburn, who has to have been one of the most astute businessmen in the history of Gravenhurst. After coming here on an excursion around the lakes, he saw the potential in Gravenhurst and he lobbied government to build a railroad north from Barrie to Muskoka. He pushed the government to begin as well a new land grant scheme. As you can see, we've got some steamships listed there. In anticipation of that railroad and seizing the moment beforehand, in 1865, he built his first steamship or steamer on the shore of Lake Muskoka, and he called it the Winona and launched it in 1866. And the Winona is pictured there. He also um, opened a store in Gravenhurst right across from where Joseph Brock had built his log home, and he called it the Montreal store, close to where the toy store exists today in Gravenhurst. He provided everything that the settler could possibly need, and he would even deliver goods to the traveler or the tourist up the lake on his new steamer. As you can see, one steamer would follow the next, and he uh, and other people would go on building steamers um, throughout the next 25, 30, 35, 40, 50 years. There's the Nipissing, which would go on to become the Seguin, the Sagamo, and the Seguin itself in early days. Look at the crowds of passengers on those ships. In 1868, Canada offered settlers a free grant of land through the Free Grant Lands and Homestead Act of 1868. The rather tattered looking document that you see on the left is a copy of an original poster that was hung to announce the act. On the right is the sort of an advertising poster that would have been sent out by the government, this one in 1871. Had this land grant scheme not been established, it is very likely that A.P. Coburn would have gone bankrupt. So here were free lands for settlers with provisos, of course, but how would the settlers get here? Well, here we have an advertisement by J.T. Harvey setting out the route to take from Toronto to Muskoka in 1869. Board the Northern Rail at Toronto to Bell Ewart. That's on Lake Simcoe. There, catch the steamer Emily May to Aurelia. At Aurelia, board the steamer Cariella to Washago, or you could row a scow if you wanted to yourself. At Washago, catch the stagecoach for Gravenhurst, all for the low, low price of $3.75 per person, not including the nights that you might have to spend along the way. It sounds very much like the first journey made by Campbell and Bain in 1860. Getting here would not be easy, but what was actually here when you got here? Let's check the 1871 census to see what existed in Gravenhurst. The population was only 400, but the village was beginning to develop some basic services and the roots of industry. The three hotels that are listed there, the Queen's, Dougal Brown Steamboat and Stage and Cooper's Royal Hotel are not luxury resort hotels. These are hotels meant to house ordinary people settlers and shopkeepers moving to the area and travelers who had to stay over between trains and steamships. Note that as early as 1871, we have a doctor in town, we have a school, we have a church, and we have talk of a railroad coming. Just a quick look at some of these amenities that I've been talking about in 1871. In the top left-hand photograph, you can see the Anglican church built on land in 1865, donated by the McCabe's and located about where the Anglican Cemetery is today, or perhaps across the road, we're not absolutely sure. 
On the right, you have an illustration of the Royal Hotel owned by Emmanuel Cooper, located where the TD Bank can be found today. And below to the left is an ad for the Steamboat and Stage Hotel owned by Dougal Brown, found where the post office stands today. And in 1866, we have the first advertisement in the Toronto Daily Globe aimed directly at tourists and sportsmen. You can think of sportsmen as being hunters and fishermen, which soon would include reference to the first purpose-built luxury hotel, but on Lake Rosso, of course. But there were still some adventurers, more than just the folks at the Muskoka Club, who would still look with disdain upon those who were seeking to bring the city luxuries to the wilderness. And speaking of adventure, we are about to embark on a whole new age of travel. In 1875, that much anticipated railway was about to become a reality. The railway had arrived in Washago in 1873, in Severn Bridge in 1874, and in April of 1875, it reached Gravenhurst, with a spur line being completed to the wharf by November of that year. Train travel might be easier, but after the train crossed into the Canadian Shield area, we can only guess at the fear and trepidation felt by passengers watching the rock walls rise up around them. What have I done? They're asking. Is this how my land is going to look? Beautiful scenery is only for those who can afford it. In this photograph, a steam train is arriving from the south at the right of the picture to the beautiful train station at Gravenhurst where town citizens, settlers, and business folk come to town and alight the train. This first station features that wonderful extended canopy where people could shelter from rain or snow before making the mad dash to the train. In summer, flower baskets hung from the arches. From here, tourists and cottagers still on the train would be anticipating their next stop. The train would then proceed to back on the spur to the wharf station where the majority of passengers on it would simply step off the train, walk across the wharf and walk onto a steamer. Their baggage would be transferred for them to the correct steamer for their destination. Look at the crowd that's gathered at the back of this photograph going from train to steamer. In many cases, they will have to switch steamers partway up the lakes to catch the next one heading to their destination. And we do have a picture somewhere, although I haven't yet found it, it's in the archives. And it's a photograph of three steamers lined up beside each other. And they have gangways attached from one steamer to the next, to the next. And passengers were actually asked to, shall we say, walk the plank from one steamer to the next to get to the right one going to where they wanted to go. In this photograph, a passenger has slipped away from the crowds on Muskoka Wharf to look over the massive steam engines that are awaiting passengers in their cars. From that first ad aimed at tourists back in 1866, the printing presses were constantly rolling out brochures, pamphlets, advertising posters, and newsprint, extolling the virtues of a Muskoka vacation, away from dirty industrial cities and the frantic pace of life there. Back to nature, at one of the lavish resort hotels that were being built on the Upper Lakes. The pamphlet shown here was printed in 1902, advertising the Muskoka Navigation Company steamers and various hotels up the lakes. Settlers? No, these aren't settlers. These crowds with their trunks upon trunks and stacks of suitcases are in fact tourists and cottagers heading up the lakes where they will stay in some cases for the entire summer. This is not Muskoka Wharf, but a landing somewhere up the lake. Some are being met here. Others have alighted from one steamer to board another that will take them directly to their chosen vacation destination. Unfortunately, in May of 1913, the Gravenhurst station that we were looking at earlier burned to the ground. The town would have to wait for the coming war to end before opening a new station in 1919. When that new station was built, the once and future king, the heir to the throne, Edward VII, 
stopped on a cross country tour to open the station and shake hands, but notice it's his left hand with some returned soldiers from the great war. He had at this point shaken so many hands on his cross country tour that his right hand was practically broken. So he used his left instead. In this photo taken just after the Great War, the trains are now stopping at the new station located on the corner of Brock Street at first. The three buildings that you see today were built successively over the next two or three years. And look at the length of that train and the number of passenger cars traveling up from the city. The station manager is out marking off those mailbags before the train pulls out. Truly, this is the age of passenger travel on trains and people took trains everywhere. Such a civilized and easy way to travel. But just when one mode of transportation becomes established and popular, along comes another one to compete and even to defeat the first. In this case, it's the motor car. Let's go back for a moment in time. Do you remember those road improvements being made way back in 1864? You know, the plank roads from Severn Bridge North for 10 miles or so with the gravel the rest of the way to Gravenhurst? Well, these photographs show you what forms those plank roads could take. The one on the left shows you one called Straddle the Gravel. The one on the left top or sorry, on the right top shows you plank over log. Or the third one in the middle shows you the humongous loads on wagons that are crushing the planks as they travel. Planks would last only a maximum of two years before having to be replaced. And you can see in that photograph that some are already cracked and broken. In these photographs, in these pictures, um, I'm going to show you the work of a, a wonderful um, artist named George Harlow White. Sometimes you get very lucky and someone comes along to chronicle an age and capture it for the future. And such was the case with him. In a series of sketches made by George Harlow White, newly arrived from England in 1873, we can get a glimpse of that colonization road 10 years after all those road improvements we were talking about. I don't know about you, it doesn't look terribly improved to me. Uh, it looks pretty much like a path still in 1873, but that is the road heading from Washego to Gravenhurst. This sketch came with a label that said, the road has been improved in places. And I guess what he's talking about here is the cribbing over the river that he is uh, um, uh, depicting here. Notice that the three people are not riding in conveyances, but are in fact walking in this picture. So when the first car is unveiled in Canada in 1898, it should be no surprise that people in Gravenhurst would want to have one too. Here a very proud Dr. Cartwright and a somewhat nervous Mrs. Fielding are about to test out the first car in Gravenhurst. Looks easy enough, doesn't it? If you can just turn that crank on the front end and get her going. All very well on the lawn and driveway at your house, but what about on the road? Oh dear. Looks like the roads have not kept pace with the technology. One could label the photo on the left, uh, the joys of the open road. But good news in the banner article on the right. In the banner for November the 1st, 1928, it's reported that the road from Severn Bridge to Gravenhurst will be reconstructed and permanently surfaced the next year in 1929. None too soon, we might say. And isn't it always going to be next year that these things are gonna happen? Despite road conditions, the freedom of a car was just too much for some former train travelers. I love this photograph because it shows just how pleasurable a road trip could really be. Here was a chance to drive for a while, take a break in the sunshine, have a picnic, take a nap, and then resume that leisurely trip north to Muskoka. Of course, some might have guessed that the allure of the open road would cause an increase in the number of cars on the road and that the trip from Toronto might become longer and longer. 
This is in Gravenhurst or Highway 11, by the way, but I couldn't resist showing you a traffic jam from the 1920s. It is a Muskoka picture. This photograph, on the other hand, is very definitely local. And many of you will recognize the spot known locally for many years as Gibraltar. It was here that the British Army veteran James Cuthbert had settled at the top of Gibraltar. He built what he called a fort up there on the top of the rocks, but it set back a little. And it was Cuthbert who fired the famous cannon salute to a traveling dignitary along the way in the 1800s. You can only imagine driving up a road where you've seen absolutely nothing until all of a sudden a cannon goes off and scares you absolutely to bits. Here's something you might not have known, <clears throat> excuse me. Did you know that cars did not run on the highway all winter, at least until 1936? The Banner story from 1930 tells of the first local car to travel southbound to Toronto this year. The car had been marooned in Bracebridge since the last fall by a heavy snowfall. That's four to five months. But now with the spring thaw in March, Mr. Goldie can make his way through the reduced depths of snow, though the writer admits that the road is by no means good, and finally get back to Toronto with his car. Some five years later, in the banner of January the 3rd, 1935, it is announced by our local MPP that the government will be snow plowing the highway from Severn Bridge to the end of the pavement just north of Huntsville. What? This is a new undertaking in a country like ours? Can you imagine it? And apparently, even after that announcement, it sounds as though the plowing really was not up to much. A rather feeble attempt, it was called, called in the newspaper. And here we see two kinds of snow plowing. One, the one on the uh, left-hand side is a, a picture, a photograph of a snowplow in 1924. So it should certainly have been in operation by now up here. And on the right-hand side, you can see another kind of snow plowing, the kind that was used on back roads. And that was actually um, a picture from Draper Township, just, just across from the ride. Although the stretch of highway on the left is looking a little slippery, it looks like by the 1940s is, it is at least being plowed. There are at least signs of banks along the road. And on the right, the surface is looking much improved. Well, maybe the winter travel had not really improved all that much, especially for buses. This gray coach bus is coming from the bus station at the end of the Albion Hotel on Brock Street but it seems to have run amok in the deep snow. Notice that Doherty Motors are on the job, but their staff are there to save the day. The train station, or sorry, the bus station at that time, it was what is now the Albion um, um, beverage room, shall we call it. That L was put on at the end uh, in order to become a gray coach uh, station. Here's what the gray coach line bus really looked like as it headed north from Gravenhurst in about 1935. This photo looks to me like the first entrance road into Huntsville. But back again to winter time, this time in 1939, this bus is attempting to pass the Nyad, a yacht which was being hauled up the Ferguson Highway or Highway 11 to you to its new home on the Lake of Bays. And the two of them are having a bit of a struggle trying to pass on that very narrow road. Here's a familiar scene for many of you. The second or newer bus station in Gravenhurst, the Lucky 11 on Bethune Drive. People have commented many times on Facebook just how good the food was there and a great place to go for an after school snack. Roads did improve through the 1950s. They were paved, they were marked with center lines, and they doubled in width and capacity. Unfortunately, the traffic also doubled exponentially. The photograph on the left is a Friday afternoon on the highway in 1967, heading north, bumper to bumper, to Muskoka. They are getting here, but slowly. The photographs on the right 
show the lineup of cars through Gravenhurst on the main street at the bottom and onto the highway going south back to Toronto again in 1967. I couldn't resist this photograph with all those big 1960s cars heading out after a May 24th weekend in Muskoka. This too is 1960s and they're coming from two directions as you can see and merging into one lane. Imagine how much fun that would be, a one lane piece of highway and they're all going to try to get there. Luckily, there were people with imagination who thought there actually might be a better way to get to Muskoka than driving in all that traffic. In fact, as far back as 1920, people thought that the best way to get here might very well be to fly. Colonel Billy Bishop and Colonel Robert Barker, World War I flying aces, came home to Canada after the Great War and tried to decide what to do now that they'd been demobbed. They decided to buy a plane and start an airline, Bishop and Barker Airplanes Limited. Bishop was married to the daughter of Lord and Lady Eaton, and she decided to fly with her son-in-law one day up to Muskoka, just for an adventure. And it certainly would have been that. It also would have really given their company some credibility. In the photograph shown here, you can see that the pilot in one of these planes is seated at the rear of the plane, while four passengers take up their places at the front, exposed to all of the elements. But they would learn not to get too cozy and relaxed up there. Picture this the next time you fly. More than once, a pilot would order his passengers to climb out of their seats and climb onto the wings and distribute themselves evenly when things got tricky. I can't even imagine doing something like that. I would have had to jump. That's all there would be to it. As for Lady Eaton, who was a force not to be trifled with, she faced her husband down when he scolded her for taking such a chance and replied that she actually felt safer in that plane with Billy than she did driving with him but it had been a chance that she had taken. For in September of that year, 1920, pilot Russell McRae was flying to Muskoka with several passengers on board when his engine stalled. He was forced to crash land in dense bush. Everyone survived, but the plane was totaled. Bishop and Barker bought a new plane, but they moved their operation to Florida where inclement weather would no longer be a factor and they could fly all year long. You get a good look at the wings there and you can picture climbing out of the seats at the front and see that front extension where it says Bishop and Barker and then crawling your way back to the wings and then two people going out on wings left and two people going out on wing right. Yowzers. But then along came another adventurer and this one was a hard working but adventure loving resident of Gravenhurst who was the first person to own a plane north of Toronto. His name was Art Ferguson and his story of hardship and ingenuity, are, that story is legend. He bought his plane in 1930 and by 1931, people like Henry Fry were taking the chance to fly with him at every opportunity, snapping photographs here, there and everywhere out of the plane at every interesting site below them. He loved to land on frozen lakes all over Muskoka. In fact, Art Ferguson liked to fly best in the wintertime. He regularly took off from the streets in Gravenhurst and landed his plane on frozen lakes all over Muskoka. All this airplane talk brings me to a brief history of our airport. For who could talk about getting here without mention of the airport? There were so many good reasons to build an airport in the dirty 30s that it is actually a miracle that the government chose to do it but they bought land near Ray and put men to work clearing it. Remember, this is a depression, so that was welcome work for them. They established an airmail post, an auxiliary base for flight training out of base Borden. Eventually they had a place to host Norwegian pilots in training. And then they continued to operate that airport until 1996 when they turned it over to the district. When COVID grounded most of our planes for the duration, we provided a parking lot for jets until they could be sorted and housed at their various home bases. 
So this photograph was taken just this past year. Countless attempts have been made to establish a successful Toronto to Muskoka to Toronto flight service over the 80 plus years that we've had an airport, but so far none has really caught on and flourished. Continue. There, apparently I've been muted for a minute or two, sorry about that. As I was just about to say, one of the best things about getting here has always been the warm welcome that awaited folks here. As far back as the 1880s, the arrival of someone important was celebrated with an arch. These arches that you see here, and there are two of them on our main street, <clears throat> are made of fir boughs and ribbons. And they show the pride that the people of Ravenhurst took in their community. These were probably erected in 1885 on the main street for the arrival of the governor general at that time, Henry Charles Keith Petty Fitzmorris, the fifth Marquis of Lansdowne. Note that the citizens have gathered beneath the arch with gifts to welcome him. I keep wondering about that white cow in the middle and wondering if he was considered to be a fatted calf or what exactly that was about him that they had him there. <clears throat> Not to, well, oh, I can't move again. Here we go. Oh, we we'll back here. Not to be outdone. The lumbermen actually decided to erect their own arch at the wharf, decorated with the tools of their trade. Lord Lansdowne would pass under that arch to reach the steamship that would be awaiting him. There are two versions of this arch with differing tools, differing decorations, and differing boats at the top. One of them built by Mickle and, and Diamond. There have been many other arches in intervening years, but by 1924 and 25, something very familiar was being erected right at the entrance to town. Note the highway, quote unquote, leading into town, which looks a little more like a dirt back road, but that is the highway coming up from Severn Bridge. This photograph of the, sorry, this photograph of the Board of Trade Arch has been dated both 1925 and 1927. Either way, the painting is complete and there are appropriate messages on both sides. On arrival, it's called Gravenhurst Gateway to Muskoka Lakes. On the departure side, it says Gravenhurst wishes you a safe return. In this 1940s version of the arch, it's fun to see Briar's Dairy in the background, but the arch has been changed substantially and perhaps not for the better. But in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, uh, paint would wear rather quickly. So no doubt the town opted for the path of least resistance when they repainted the original arch. Braces have been added on both sides, and I don't know whether it's for design effect or for structural strength. Our arch has gotten a little darker now in the 1950s and maybe perhaps heading to the 60s, but at least we still have a gateway arch other communities were beginning to lose theirs by this time. You can also see a round BA gasoline sign peeking out from behind the upright. This version of the arch made of stone and cast iron trim simply announces that this is Gravenhurst. The whole effect is not very attractive, but still we have managed to retain, maintain our iconic arch. And you can see there, there's a motel over on the left-hand side of the photograph. But then, joy of toys. We've come back to the very beginning and recreated the beautiful arch that we have today with the original messages and look that was here. Many other towns had arches, but very few of them have been able to keep them. And we owe the citizens 
who made this arch happen again, a deep debt of gratitude. In times long ago, indigenous peoples roamed Muskoka, moving to hunt, to fish, and so on as the seasons changed. Getting here mostly involved walking for them, although many would have used horses and watercraft that they had made to travel our region. I have not attempted to tell of their travels and I would not presume to do so. That is a story left best to First Peoples themselves. And I hope we have a chance to hear that story soon. Instead, I began with a map in 1836 that really did not speak of Muskoka at all, <clears throat> other than that tiny little name sitting on a lake. This was all wilderness country then, unknown to any but indigenous people at the time. Over the years from 1852 to 2020, we have looked at getting here and how and why we did it. From footprints in the snow, to stagecoaches over corduroy roads, to steamers on the lakes, to trains that met those steamers, and to the cars and the planes that would take us into the modern age of travel, we've used every way imaginable and some not so easily imagined to get here because here is special. We had to get here because here is home. Thank you for traveling with me tonight. I'll leave you with some further pictures and ask that if you have any questions to actually go to the chat room to ask them. Megan will read the questions and read them to me and I will then hopefully repeat the question and answer it. Thanks very much, Judy. <laughs> Looks like we've got a question. Megan, Megan's looking after that, so. It's, it says four in the chat room. Oh. oh, telling me that I'm muted? Oh, okay, all right, yeah. I'll just make a comment on the pictures I've left you with. The photograph in the center is a, is a photo of a McLean's uh, magazine cover. And that uh, cover happened in July of 1948. I thought it was really iconic. It was about Muskoka. And I don't think that all of those names are actually real names, but they were showing what happens when a young lady is trying to get to Muskoka to work at one of the lodges. Up in the top uh, left-hand corner, you can see up there yet another version of a very early car in Gravenhurst, and that's Claude Snyder behind the wheel. Um, I couldn't make out on the license plate, which is number 2191, whether or not it was 1902 or 1912. It could have been either. The picture at the top of the right-hand side shows yet another version of a traffic jam, I suppose, on the highway coming into Gravenhurst. And there are some cars there all lining up. The car coming towards us is, of course, leaving. Um, those cars are probably 1930s into the 40s. Down at the bottom on the left-hand side, you see three um, very nicely set out rigs with horses. I suspect that those young men are comparing their rigs to one to another and saying, I have a better horse and my rig is nicer than your rig. Um, and they're actually parked on the main street of Gravenhurst, um, probably up just a little bit from uh, where the post office is today, north a little bit from there. And of course, the iconic Seguin, I had to have it there um, to finish with our beautiful Seguin. No questions? No All right. In that case, I bid you good night and thank you for traveling with me. Well, on behalf of everybody who attended this uh, great presentation, thank you, Judy, for it. And uh, we'll see you again in the future. Thank you all. Have a great night. <laughs>